How do you add tension and drama to a scene where we have an actor playing an actor, playing a guest villain spot on a TV pilot that he himself views as beneath him? How does Quentin Tarantino add real stakes to a fake TV show? Layering fiction is something of a Tarantino trademark. Come on, let's get in character. His characters often find themselves playing characters and telling smaller stories within the broader narrative. Look, man, an undercover cop's got to be Marlon Brando, right? To do this job, you got to be a great actor. You got to be naturalistic. You got to be naturalistic as hell. Can you convincingly masquerade as someone who's an expert on mandingo fighting? Why? Because my character is that of a big money buyer from Düsseldorf here in Greenville to buy my way into the Mandingo fight game. And your character is a Mandingo expert that hired to help me do it. When story elements are purely fiction, even within the film's universe, these scenes could lack a sense of importance. There's a fundamental issue at play with having a fictional story within a fictional story. The nested second narrative lacks the stakes of the primary narrative. But Tarantino always sidesteps this pitfall, and in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, he manages to make a fake pilot shoot serve as the climax to his protagonist's emotional journey. This potentially minor scene from the fake Lancer TV pilot is made emotionally impactful due to the way Tarantino approaches every present element from a character level. There are three key extrinsic elements within this sequence that add emotional stakes to the story within a story and deepen the audience's understanding of Rick Dalton. First, wardrobe. The costume, hair, and makeup determined by the pilot's director, Sam Wanamaker. Second, Rick's reputation especially through the eyes of his director and his young co-star. And third, real-world consequences, the life led by Rick Dalton when out of character. Each of these elements is subtly introduced by Tarantino throughout the lead-up to the big Lancer scene. Rick Dalton is a fading screen star who has somewhat begrudgingly been cast to play Caleb, the villainous guest star heavy in the Lancer TV pilot. Our first extrinsic element, the wardrobe, is thrust upon Rick by his director, Sam Wanamaker. Now, I want a whole new look for Caleb. I don't want this Western costume the way they costume the Big Valley and Bonanza for the last decade. I want a zeitgeist flair in the costumes. Wanamaker is a progressive director with more of a creative vision than the other directors Rick has worked with. The costume he chooses for Caleb is unorthodox and made to have what he calls a zeitgeist flair. I want to give him a hippie jacket. Something he could wear into the London fog tonight and look like the hippest guy in the room. Far out. We got a Custer jacket, mm -hmm. fringes all down the arm. It's tan now, but I dyed dark brown. He could hit the strip in it tonight. <coughs> Where does 1869 and 1969 meet? Especially when it comes to you, Caleb. Mm. The costume is somewhat anachronistic and is designed as a bridging of two time periods, which perfectly reflects Rick's troubled career. He rose to the top in the old Hollywood system, but the cinematic landscape is changing right under his feet. New Hollywood is on its way in, and Rick is struggling to maintain relevancy. But by 1969, they never saw this happening. The culture had changed. Yeah. Mm. And now the new leading man is not He-Man kind of macho guys that put pomade in their hair. It's skinny, androgynous, shaggy-haired type guys. So now it's Michael Sarazan. Now it's Christopher Jones. Now it's like the hippie sons of famous people like uh, young Michael Douglas and even Arlo Guthrie starring in movies. You know, now if Rick's gonna get a part of one of their movies, he's probably gonna be the cop who's busting them. Well, it was, it was uh, interesting to play this sort of guy that uh, is in a way r reached this expiration date culturally. Rick doesn't understand any of this stuff as far as New Hollywood is concerned. If he was offered deliverance, he turned it down. What? No one wants to see that. Who the hell wants to see that? <laughs> He's wrong, but he doesn't know that. It's the Hollywood he'd been taught. The very notion of changing Rick's hairstyle immediately puts him on edge and offers a keen insight into how he views acting as star-driven rather than character-driven. Now, Rick, about your hair. Oh, what about my hair? I want to go with a different hairstyle. <laughs> What? Wanamaker is sticking him in a costume that's designed to push Rick out of his comfort zone. He's a director who sees Rick's potential, 
but also sees that he's not living up to that potential and instead falling into complacency. And Rick has never changed his look his entire career. Very much like a 50s leading man, all right? The way he wore his hair then is the way he's gonna wear his hair forever. He's an actor that has spent his career combing his th hair and, and, and creating a pompadour his whole life. His, that's what he knows, and he's not making this sort of transition into this new era of Hollywood. For the first time in likely a good long while, a director has hired Rick for his talents as a thespian instead of for his profile as a star. If you got me covered up in all this, uh, <coughs> this junk, uh, how's the audience gonna know it's me? <laughs> I hope they don't. Mm. This brief exchange offers a remarkable insight into each of these characters. Learning of Wanamaker's character-based priorities helps shift Rick's perception of this pilot into a favorable light from his previously held opinion. Now in another couple of years playing punching bag to every swinging dick new to the network, that's gonna have a psychological effect on how the audience perceives you. That it was potentially damaging to his career, as suggested by Marvin Schwarz. This leads into our second extrinsic element. No director has ever asked to change Rick's hair before. But when you see you in that wig, you don't have to be a relic of 1959. Right. You could be a modern actor. You and could you could be in a new Hollywood movie. Wanamaker is challenging him, and Rick wants to live up to his expectations, not just for Wanamaker's sake, but also for the sake of his own self-worth. Wanamaker drives Rick to strive for greatness. After flubbing lines in an earlier scene, Line, go, go fetch her and tell her what? Rick has a meltdown in his trailer. <laughs> Jesus Christ! We only see brief snippets of the Lancer pilot. We aren't privy to the full story, and we don't know these characters. It would be foolhardy to expect an audience to be emotionally invested in the story of the Lancer pilot, something that I think Tarantino kind of forgot in his novelization of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But the film gets the balance just right. Tarantino keeps the Lancer scenes gripping by never losing sight of the man playing the villain. The dramatic tension in the scene doesn't come from whether or not the big bad guy Caleb is going to come out on top against Johnny Madrid. Instead, it comes from whether or not Rick Dalton can pull off the scene and live up to his expectations and the expectations of those around him. Rick's reputation and self-respect are on the chopping block if he fails to deliver a spectacular performance. You that little fucking girl. You're gonna show that goddamn Jim Stacy. You're gonna show all of them on that goddamn fucking set who the fuck Rick Dalton is, all right? These are the stakes that matter, as opposed to the in-universe stakes of the Lancer pilot. Rick desperately wants to earn the respect of his precocious co-star. If I can be a tiny bit better, I want to be. She is the model of utmost professionalism and passion for the craft of acting, two things that Rick has lost touch with. It's the actor's job to avoid impediments to their performance. It's the actor's job to strive for 100% effectiveness. Trudy's work ethic is the antithesis of Rick's. He so badly wishes he could say Trudy reminds him of himself, but the only person who reminds him of himself is the washed up protagonist of his Western paperback. It's okay. It sounds like a really sad book. Poor is he brazy. Rick doesn't avoid any impediments. In fact, he seemingly makes it his goal to run face first into as many impediments as possible. I hate fucking whiskey, sir. I couldn't stop it fucking three or four of eight. He's constantly drinking and smoking. He's sick, coughing, spitting, and hungover. <coughs> He's a complete mess, a shadow of his former self and a far cry from the man his ego demands him to be. Seeing just how seriously this young girl takes the craft of acting is a wake-up call for Rick. Until meeting Trudy, Rick had been trapped in a routine of self-pity, wondering why his career was stagnating. Seeing himself through Trudy's eyes makes him realize that he has only his own low aspirations and work ethic to blame. Rick had been viewing himself as a shallow reflection of his glory days. Through Wanamaker's eyes, he sees the true potential within himself. And through Trudy's eyes, unaware of his stardom, he sees himself as he truly is. A broken down has been wasting time feeling sorry for himself instead of trying to improve. 
Trudy and Wanamaker give Rick the clarity and the motivation he needs to strive for better things, and the resulting performance is one that impresses them both. We're all good. Don't need to go again. No, we're done. That was fantastic. He earns some much needed affirmation, but more importantly, he reproves his worth as an actor to himself. The personal stakes are indisputably high and take full priority over the narrative stakes within the Lancer pilot, which leads us into the third extrinsic element. In addition to the emotional drama of Rick Dalton's inner crisis, Tarantino also adds real-world consequences to impact Rick's life off the back lot. The precarious state of Rick's career with the risk of sliding into obscurity is compounded by his own self-doubt. Nowhere is this self-doubt more apparent than in his clear insecurities regarding The Great Escape. Was it true you almost got the McQueen part in The Great Escape? When asked about his almost starring in The Great Escape, Rick is filled with shame. Not starring in The Great Escape, losing that role to Steve McQueen, this is the largest failure of Rick's life, and I think it's likely what began his downward spiral. Rick Dalton and Steve McQueen had a classic Hollywood rivalry, similar perhaps to the real rivalry between McQueen and Paul Newman. They came from similar beginnings, but where McQueen slid effortlessly from TV into feature films and became the king of cool, Dalton's foray into features was far less successful, and his career has been on the decline ever since. McQueen won, and Dalton lost. Losing The Great Escape, losing to McQueen in particular, killed Rick's confidence destroyed his self-worth. Delivering a spectacular performance as the villain in a TV pilot is unlikely to revitalize Rick's career, but it does manage to serve as the act of redemption he so badly needs, proving to everyone, most importantly himself, that he truly is talented at his craft. At his most vulnerable, Rick threatens to kill himself if he fails to deliver in the scene. You don't get these lines right. I'm gonna blow your fucking brains out tonight. All right, your brains are gonna be splattered all over your goddamn pool. This ratchets the stakes up as high as they can possibly go. Rick's mortality hangs in the balance. This threat of suicide sadly comes from reality, as much of the Rick Dalton character does. And I told him about the actor P. Duell who was on the show. And somewhere in the second season, he committed suicide. I did a little bit of research and found out a little bit that he had a bit of a drinking problem. It sounds like the guy was undiagnosed bipolar and he had mood swings. And the reason that he was drinking was to self-medicate himself. Leo got that. <laughs> this performance scene is the true climax of Rick's story. The fallout with the Manson followers and the button with the Polanskis are less intrinsically important to his character on a personal level. Even though Rick is cast as the villain, there's a reason why Tarantino presents his walk back to set like the Western hero marching toward the big showdown. Because that's exactly what it is. Delivering a great performance in this Lancer scene is Rick's showdown, except the villain he's facing off with isn't any of his co-stars, it's his own limitations. That was the best acting I've ever seen in my whole life. Thank you. So let's recap. How did Tarantino add real stakes to a fake TV show? He approached the drama from a character perspective, focusing on Rick Dalton instead of the narrative of Lancer. He ensured weighty consequences existed both internally and externally for Rick, away from the TV backlot. And he provided the perspectives of other characters, finally giving Rick the proper motivation to give it his all after being crushed by failure. Nailing each of these elements, as Tarantino does, allows the conclusion to his protagonist's arc to arrive while he himself is in character within the bounds of a second fictional reality. Thanks for watching. You can find my other video essays in the playlist on screen. Until next time, so long.